Hey everyone, I hope you are all safe and doing well. As you are all aware, the last weeks have been a bit out of control, so for safety reasons we decided to record this last lesson so you can actually finish the schedule in time, but unfortunately that means that we won't be able to do this interactively. I have never recorded the lecture before, so we see how many takes it might take me to finally get this recording, but I will try my best to explain the main topics as well as possible to you guys without seeing your faces to see how well I can bring my point across. If there are points that are unclear at the end of this presentation, or if you have follow-up questions, I will be available um, for those questions at the beginning of the last session of the series, which will be held on April 2nd. So without further ado, let's talk about neurorehabilitation. If I get this presentation to work, okay. So in one of your last sessions, um, you learned in depth about traumatic brain injury, what it is and how it may impair the brain and as a consequence, decrease the quality of life of the patient that suffers from this injury. Today in this lesson, lesson, I want to focus on what comes afterwards for the patient. What can we actually do to help this patient back into their homes, back into their lives, back to being able to brush their own teeth, back to even being, getting, being able to get out of bed in the morning on their own. So this is somewhat an obsolete slide. We are all very aware of the fact that the neurological conditions such as traumatic brain injury, cerebral palsy, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury will impact our quality of life by impairing our brain function and that that is often very dramatic. While many of these insults and diseases have their own challenges that need to be addressed in clinical care, they do share common basic principles in their course of recovery that we can exploit with a shared similar treatment plan. In the next slides, I will talk a lot about stroke in particular, mainly because it's the most common neurological condition found in the hospital and in clinical care. Also because I did my PhD in stroke research, so I have learned to acknowledge the many, many obstacles that are still present today in clinical care for the, to, before we are actually able to get the patients the clinical care that they should be able to get. However, I do think that there are basic principles of recovery and clinical care that I am gonna to talk to you, um, about to you guys today in the following slides, um, and that those um, basic principles do apply to other neurological conditions as well, and they are transferable between all of these conditions. This becomes especially clear, clear when you look at some of the symptoms that are caused by the stroke. They range from mobility problems, especially targeted to arm movements, um, to visual problems, speech and communication, difficulties in swallowing, loss of bladder control, neuropathic pain, fatigue and extreme tiredness, and emotional difficulties, such as, for example, anxiety and depression. As you can acknowledge from this list, the, stroke, um, the incidence of a stroke can impair motor, sensory, or cognitive tasks, so it's not selective for either of those, while some of the other um, neurological conditions show more of one of those um, sub-problems. However, in 80% of all stroke survivors, motor function is deeply impacted by the incident of the stroke. Symptoms of this um, impact might include loss of balance, difficulties in walking and grasping objects, troubles to recognize the surrounding, muscle fatigue, and a lack of coordination. You can probably imagine how these symptoms might influence the patient in a way that he or she cannot go back to their normal lives right away. Often, even without getting out of bed, even getting out of bed can be a big struggle, let alone grasping and manipulating object, objects, such as, for example, a spoon for eating. In stroke, the motor symptoms usually occur on one side of the body, which we refer to as hemiparesis, half-sided weakness. While in other conditions, these symptoms can be seen on both sides of the body. In these drawings, you can, for example, acknowledge how arm, hand, and leg functions might be impacted by the stroke and how patients lose control of op even opening and closing their hand to grasp objects or even going further, extending their arm to reach for the object in the first place. I want to briefly explain again what exactly happens during 
a stroke, even though you might have already heard about it in your last lessons. A stroke is caused by a sudden reduction of blood flow to areas of the brain, which can either be caused by local bleeding or by a blood clot that blocks the blood flow. Both of these incidents will cause a reduction of oxygen supply to the downstream neuronal areas, causing the neurons to basically starve to death because they're missing their nutrition. When looking at the process, progress of biological processes in the weeks and months after a stroke, we can see that in the first few hours after stroke, there is a massive increase in cell death in the stroked area, here plotted in the sort of peach colored area. In the following days to weeks, we have an increase in neuroinflammation, which kind of causes a second peak of uh, cell death. And after the initial inflammation, is resolved, we start seeing neuroregenerative processes, which will happen weeks to months after the initial injury. The first phase we usually refer to as the acute phase, while the green plotted in green phase, we usually refer to chronic phase. So, as both phases might differ massively in the biological processes that are happening in them, as I just explained, one being neurons are dying and in the other ones we start seeing regeneration, we can and actually have to develop treatment options for both phases individually. Let, let's look at the acute phase first. As I said, in the acute phase, we observe neuronal death due to oxygen deprivation. In 80% of the cases, that's actually caused by a blood clot um, that blocks blood flow, so it's an ischemic stroke. And the best course of action here is to reestablish blood flow as fast as possible so that the neurons who are slowly starving will get their nutrition back. The FDA-approved treatment for this is TPA, um, which is an enzyme that will eat away the blood clot, a process called thrombolysis. Thrombo meaning blood clot, Lysis meaning disintegrate. An alternative, or let's just say rather an additional approach, would be to supplement food for the neurons or to make them less likely to die because of the uh, lower nutrition, basically protecting them from the negative consequences of oxygen deprivation. This can be done by pharmaceut pharmaceutical treatment options, but so far there aren't many drugs that made it into clinical care and the long-term studies are still missing. So this is more of a hypothetical treatment option at this point. The goal of either treatment is to save as much brain as possible. As you can imagine, time is key here. In this image, the red area plot plotted here marks um, the neurons that will definitely die because they're deeply impacted. The stroke is right at this, um, at this area. The green area that is plotted here are new, in, in this area, um, neurons have a reduced oxygen supply, so they are at risk to die. Um, however, there is still a chance to save them um, if, we, if they are treated immediately. If we cannot make that happen in time, you can see that after one hour, already this red area becomes bigger, more neurons are pushed over the edge um, to die and cannot be saved. And then after six hours, all of the neurons that were at risk without treatment have now um, died and thus the stroke area has um, expanded. In summary, in the first acute phase, time is literally brain and any sort of treatment has to be applied as early as possible to save as much brain as possible. This is easier said than done because Many of the patients simply don't make it in the hospital on time because they don't realize they, don't, they have a stroke. They might, there might be really small strokes that you don't necessarily immediately catch or because they live far away and don't make it within the six hour time, uh, time frame. And even if they do make it, there are very strict criteria whether do you get the treatment of TPA or not. Doctors have to be, for example, 100% sure that you have an ischemic stroke and not an hemorrhagic stroke because for hemorrhagic strokes, thrombolytic treatment actually has negative consequences because it, it increases the bleeding. In the end, only five to ten of uh, five to ten percent 
of all stroke patients are actually eligible to early treatment. This is a very low number. So that being said, what can we do to help them if, if, only, if we can only help a minority of the patients in the acute phase? What, what can we do about the chronic phase in the end? So here we finally get to the point of neurorehabilitation. Once the brain function is impaired, the main goal of clinical care is to restore and maximize the functions that have been lost due to impairments caused by the neurological condition. I have to say currently neurorehabilitation is the only available treatment option for chronic stroke patients and there are very few alternatives for other neurological conditions, which is so important that we focus in, on it today. In brief, neurorehabilitation is the clinical subspecialty that is devoted to the restoration and maximization of functions that have been lost due to the impairments caused by injury or disease of the nervous system. Training therapies of neurorehabilitation address motor function, sensory function, and cognitive or mood conditions. So even though I'm going to talk a lot about the motor functions, there are other ter therapy plans that will address more sensory um, or cognitive condition, uh, functions. Also, we have to acknowledge that neurorehabilitation is cross-sectional and interdisciplinary, meaning that it combines coordinated effort of diverse sectors. Um, for example, the neuropsychologists, um, doctors and nurses, social workers, and of course the therapists who apply treatments such as physiotherapy, speech therapy, and even music therapy. And once the patient is released from the hospital, family and community of the patient will further influence the recovery of the patient. So if you want to increase the recovery of the patient to the best of your possibilities, you have to coordinate between all of those um, sect sectors to uh, guarantee the best possible outcome. The main goal of neurorehabilitation, that is, um, I want to emphasize again, available for all of the different um, conditions, is to help the patients improve their functions um, of act for activities of daily living. It aims to accelerate recovery, reduce symptoms, and generally uh, aims to elevate the well-being of the patient, thereby maximizing also the independence of the patient. And overall, the main goal is to improve the quality of life for the patient. Neurorehabilitation is a fairly new clinical approach. It was only really implemented in, implemented in clinical care after 1985. This is mainly due to the central dogma of neurobiology that was posed by one of the most famous scientists ever, Ramon y Cajal. You've probably heard his name come up in this series, lecture series a lot because he was one of the most influential neuroscientists ever and also did amazingly pretty and accurate drawings of neurons and glia without even having the proper tools such as those, which are just stunning to look at in my opinion. But before I get too much into geek mode, he had something to say about the nervous system too, which was this. Once development is complete, the sources of growth and regeneration of axons and dendrites are irretrievably lost. In the adult brain, the nerve paths are fixed and immutable. Everything can die, nothing can be regenerated. This is a rather grim view onto our nervous system and was believed by scientists all over the world. Basically, this would mean that after development, once we are an adult, we are fixed, our nervous system will not change. Any insult will lead to an irretrievable loss of function, and that's that. He did follow up his sentence with this. It is for the science of the future, future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. And many scientists luckily took on this challenge, but it did take a lot of time for scientists to realize that even though he was a genius in many ways, this view could not be further from the truth and that the brain indeed can fix itself and might change. This can be even seen without any treatment in patients of stroke. The Fugel-Meyer tests um, assessment tests patients in a specific scale for several movements or sensory processing. 
With this test, patients are asked to perform single movements such as raising one arm or flex their shoulders. Um, and these movements will be scored based on whether the patient is able to perform the movement. In the end, the scores can be summed up of each individual movement, while the maximum score to reach on the motor scale is 100 points. This is one of the most commonly used assessments that we can use to see whether stroke patients get better or not. And uh, in this graph, several patients with different stroke sizes were tested for 180 days after their stroke. And as you can see, see they started off uh, at different levels depending on the severity of the stroke. So a stroke with a milder, uh, a patient with a milder stroke started off not too bad from the maximum of 100 point, while this um, patient had a very severe stroke and was basically not able to, um, or basically shows almost no motor cap capabilities at all. However, when you follow these patients over time and you reassess them every other week or so, you can see um, some form of improvement in this Fugelmeyer assessment over time, especially in the first three months after stroke. These patients recovered to some extent without interference by treatment. However, you can also see that not all of them get back to baseline levels and there's still room for improvement. If we were to understand the biological processes underlying the spontaneous recovery, the hope is that maybe we could push them further to increase the functional recovery of all the patients to get them to almost baseline levels. The mechanisms that researchers believe to be underlying um, the spontaneous recovery we just looked at is neuroplasticity. If you remember, you came across this term already very recently. It is also the underlying mechanism through which our brain is able to learn and integrate skills. For example, learning to play the piano even in adulthood. To learn the piano, we would need to be exercising specific hand movements. Oops, sorry, I'm trying to get the laser pointer to work. Here we go. Um, so we would need to exercise the, um, the hand movements which would lead to an increase in synaptic strength and a general improve in brain health. Thereby, we would strengthen the circuitries that are underlying the specific movement, which leads in the end to an improved behavior. And as I cannot stop mentioning, this does not only affect motor, but it can also affect cognition, mood, and also sensory processes. If you think about it, recover, recovery after injury is basically just a relearning of movement. For example, by using alternative compensatory movements. One example being if you, have, uh, if you use your unleashed hand or by rotating the hand in a specific way to pick up the object. In this way, we can strengthen circuits that are previously dormant to participate in our movement, which is highly comparable to the way we learn a completely new skill. In that sense, neurorehabilitation can be looked as, at as applied neuroplasticity. We utilize the capacity of the brain to still learn, to strengthen weakened circuits, or create new ones to replace the lost function. Oh, yes, that should have come first, sorry. So if you think of neuroplasticity as the way to reorganize neural pathways as a result of experience or exercise, there are two types of plasticity that we can think of, also in the context of functional recovery. First, the brain area is capable of shifting functions from the damaged area plotted here in gray um, to undamaged areas like the pink one uh, that now becomes a blue one, um, thereby strengthening previously existing pathways in a process that we call functional plasticity. Additionally, the brain can change its structure by growing axons and synapses to find new ways to innervate targets that have lost its innervation. After the injury, a process that we refer to as structural plasticity. Both types of plasticity can theoretically be utilized to drive recovery, but unfortunately we are far, far from understanding brain circuitry at the level needed to place new neurons and neural connections in just the right place at the right time to restore lost function. 
This means that it is still hard for clinical care to drive structural plasticity in a targeted enough way. Most of our clinical efforts therefore target functional plasticity um, more so than structural plasticity. I want to emphasize that neurorehabilitation neuro is evidence-based me medicine, which means that it is designed for each patient individually depending on their current status, on clinical judgment, and on the scientific evidence on, that is available to the team at this point in time. As neurorehabilitation is thought to be applied neuroplasticity, I would like to discuss now the principles of neuroplasticity with you while pointing out how they relate to neurorehabilitation and how we can utilize those um, principles in actual clinic care. Principle one of learning and relearning is the dogma that you have likely already heard about. Use it or lose it. By using the circuits required for a certain task when doing the task, synapses are strengthened and we can support functional recovery of the patient. A failure in using the circuits will lead to a degradation of the function and our body will basically just forget that it was able to do this task, as if it was zapped. A clinical measure to ensure the principle is followed is, for example, constraint-induced movement therapy. Here, we block the patient from using their unaffected arm, which, will, which many of them do because it's just easier and it is very frustrating not to be able to grasp the object in front of you. So why not pick it up with your unlesioned arm? So by blocking this unlesioned arm, we force him or her to use their affected arm. This will, be this will strengthen the neurons and their connections, as you can see here, after, co uh, after constraint-induced movement therapy. Sorry. Um, here. Uh, this neuron actually grew more axons and dendrites, or more dendrites, sorry, no axons. <laughs> they only have one axon. They uh, grew more dendrites, and they uh, that usually reflects also more connectivity to other circuits and thereby we can prevent them from being degraded. Based on this, you can also imagine that if you use it very intensely, you will improve on your function. So use it and improve it. This is evident when you are trying to learn an instrument, but also after injury, we can see this, for example, in the mouse cortex. In this mouse brain, we can see the areas that are responsible for poor limb movements plotted here in green, as well as head movements such as jar, tongue, and neck um, plotted here in yellow. After an injury to the forelimb cortex, you can see that the forelimb area actually decreases, even in the areas where it wasn't injured. We can now train these animals intensely in a task where they have to use their forelimbs to grasp a pellet through a slit um, to improve their uh, forelimb skills, which will look something like that. This is a sugar pellet that they really want to eat, so they grasp for it, thereby using their hand, and by placing the pellet in the right place, we can also force them to use the lesioned hand. And after this high-intensity training, you can see that the forelimb map actually was built again um, and that it increases again. So this increase in motor map after injury, um, we do not see if we do not train the animals in this task. This means that high intensity training can induce plasticity and increase functional recovery, use it and improve it. In a clinical setting, this unfortunately can be difficult for patients thanks to their many deficits caused by the stroke or injury generally. How are you supposed to train intensely your muscles if they are weak and tired? One way to help the patients train, oh yeah, also I wanted to mention that uh, this task that we can use with the animals is highly comparable to what we do um, grasping for food. So one way to help the patients train more intensely is, for example, by supporting them uh, using weight-supported treadmills. Here the patients don't have to carry their own body weight, um, but they can train their foot movements while being supported on this treadmill without having the fear to fall over. Other methods include robot assi robotic assisted therapy, for, ex for example, arm movements where the robot can assist and steer the movements if necessary, um, if they are too difficult for the patients, but the patient will still be able to train 
on the, uh, certain arm movements with their arm using this uh, machine. The same goes for exoskeletons, which support the posture of the patients, and they will be able to move around more freely using this exoskeleton. The specificity of the training is also a principle that has to be addressed. You can appreciate it if you are trying to learn the piano. This does not automatically translate into being able to play the guitar as well. Along those lines, if you train one specific task during rehabilitation, you won't necessarily be better in other tasks. One example is if you train your patient to swallow after a stroke, this does not mean that, the, that, this, that they will also get better in producing sound or voice, even though the same area is affected by the training. Both tasks are steered by a very specific motor engram, and each engram has to be trained separately. In clinical care, this can be taken into account by a training very specific task that the patient will need to enhance the quality of life, for example, using a knife to spread butter on a, on a toast or uh, pouring water or putting small objects as shown here. The next principle um, that I want to go into is that repetition matters. Whichever task is to be trained has to repeat it over and over. This obviously doesn't come to a surprise. You all know that it takes repetition to consolidate uh, the memory to make sure that it's not just a short-term memory, but will stay with us for a long time. And you've all had to repeat the stuff for your exams over and over. As you all also know, repeating things over and over is not always too much fun. So in this one, in this principle, what we can do for the patient is to keep them motivated. Um, to participate in the training. Um, in my studies, we can, for example, do that using an enriched environment, which means we give them toys and challenges in their home cage so that they are constantly stimulated to use them, which uh, will motivate them way more than just having them in an empty cage. Um, and this will actually increase their neuroplasticity and also their recovery after stroke, especially when combined with intense training. This can be seen in this uh, plot if you follow the lines. Um, the group that showed the best recovery after injury, so here we have a drop after the injury in motor function, um, which recovers back, especially if there's an enriched trainment and a high intense training applied. So in the clinical setting, you might imagine this is kind of hard to do if you think about the patient being immobilized to the hospital bed. Visiting hours are limited, the interaction with nurses and doctors is also limited, and they often even don't feel well enough to participate in any kind of training. One way to handle this is to make the training more fun for them, using, for example, games in the hospital and later also in the rehabilitation settings. These can often also be virtual reality-based to especially engage the patient to use all of their muscles uh, to participate in the training. And um, current uh, clinical trials are also ongoing to see if you can use these settings for compet oh, these settings can also be used for com competitive challenges. Um, and uh, um, between patients and their families, thus immensely training, um, immensely increasing the fun and maybe also the frustration during the training. The intensity of the training is another co-founding factor on how fast and how much uh, they can learn. Um, this is not surprising if you look at muscle training. It takes an intense training schedule for the body to build up the amount of muscles like Arnold Schwarzenegger had back in the day. You can apply the same rules to the brain and how it builds up memory, and even further, how we can enhance recovery after the brain, uh, after the brain injury. One way to look at this principle in a clinical setting is transcranial magnetic stimulation. Here, we stimulate the neurons of the brain using a magnetic field that we can apply from the outside of the brain, and this magnetic field actually excites the neurons. This way, we can strengthen their connectivity to specific muscle groups. We can measure this connectivity by actually measuring down at the, um, at the muscles on how much they have been activated by the brain. And um, after we apply the stimuli, the magnetic field, 
Um, and in this graph, you can hopefully appreciate if we measure the motor output, only high intensity um, stimuli are able to actually engage this muscle in, a, in comparison to low intensity stimuli. So this shows us that intensity indeed is an important factor and using this transcranial magnetic stimulation, we can also ensure that the neurons are actually actively engaged. So the timing of the treatment obviously matters as well. Um, it might come to as a surprise to you at first, after all, if neurorehabilitation is applied neuro neuroplasticity, we should always be able to use and restructure our brain when learning, right? There shouldn't be a specific time to it. That is true, and even with the delay of years, rehabilitative training has shown to increase functional recovery, at least for a bit. But recent research has shown that there is a window of opportunity, also called a critical period. Um, in which rehabilitative training shows additionally strong efficacy. Right after induction of stroke, the first reaction of the brain is shock, stress and inflammation at the time when neurons die. But as I said before, it does shift into a phase of neuroregenerative processes after that phase. And indeed studies show that phases of upregulated growth factors and downregulated um, growth inhibiting factors making the brain especially perceptive to recovery enhancing treatments in this critical period of rehabilitation. Additionally, you may also consider this. During the critical period, if you were to train compensatory movements, such as rotating your shoulder, as shown here, usually if we pick up this mug, we would just grab for it and, um, and directly lift it up. But if you were to um, try this without targeted treatment, you might develop compensatory movements such as you might rotate your shoulder, you might assist your lesioned arm using your unlesioned arm, or you might just straight away use your unlesioned um, arm to pick up this mark. In this way, in this case, your recovery may even be considered maladaptive because you might lose the chance to actually retrain your lesioned arm. In clinical settings, this means we should engage the patients as early as possible. There are trials up and running right now testing the earliest possible time point to start with the treatment, because too early might also be bad if the brain is still trying to figure out what's really going on, but then is um, forced into training. Additionally, for chronic stroke patients, it might be possible to reset the brain into this critical period by applying, for example, growth factors or other pharmacological treatment options, which have been, has been shown in animal research to massively increase the potential of rehabilitative training after stroke, as you can see in this blue line in the graph. So here we applied first um, consecutive, um, so this was a two-week treatment with a growth, in, uh, growth factor, basically, um, followed by two weeks of rehabilitative training. And if you have a control, um, um, factor, sorry, if you have a control um, antibody that doesn't do any, anything um, to enhance growth, but then give rehabilitative training delayed, you don't see as much um, recovery in these animals as with the combined treatment, where we see an almost full recovery. However, there will be more research needed into what exactly makes a growth-promoting regener regenerative-friendly state in the brain before we are able to fully understand and transfer this knowledge into clinical settings. As you can imagine, the age also matters in case of learning and memory. While we are young, it is much easier for us to learn certain skills and tasks. Our long-term memory will build up much faster, same as our working memory working memory is way more efficient. These cap capabilities decrease with age, along with a reduced synaptogenesis and cortical map reorganizations. Um, in terms of recovery after stroke, we should therefore expect the same tendencies. Rehabilitative training will take much more effort to push successful functional recovery in elderly patients, which is devastating considering the fact that age is also a risk factor to even have a stroke in the first place. 50% of all stroke victims are 75 years and older. 
In a clinical setting, this means that we have to be especially stringent in motivating the elderly to participate in the training for the reorganization that is necessary for recovery to take place. One way to ensure that patients are participating is by actually apply, supplying training opportunities in their own homes. Modern technologies offer a lot of new possibilities to do this. One idea, for example, that is being tested for feasibility and motivational success right now is having a device around the wrist that measures activity at home and might even motivate to start movements in case of long inactivity. So this is basically a training Fitbit for stroke patients. And these training devices might even be based on commercially available consoles for everyone to train, maybe even with their loved ones. There are two more things that have to be considered when we're preparing treatment schedules for patients. Transference can aid in the recovery process. It refers to the ability of plasticity of one circuit to promote following plasticity. For example, training of certain tasks might prime the brain into a mood for change and excite the circuits in a way that makes it easier for other tasks to be learned. Considering this, it might be best to have certain types of trainings scheduled in accordance with specific other training sessions. Another way to promote this in clinics is to pre-excite certain circuits to be able to learn. One way this has been done, for example, is epidural stimulation in spinal cord injury, a trial that was recently done in Switzerland. An implant of electrodes allowed neurons to communicate with, with each other during movement and enabled a few numbers of patients that had no ability to use their feet to walk again. After this initial excitation, the patients were able to train their locomotion circuits to increase their recovery potential further. The opposite, though, can also, be, uh, can also occur. Inference describes the ability of plasticity to impede induction of plasticity, basically saying that your brain might be in a bad mood, and even if you are training, the rearrangements needed for recovery would not stick. This might even go so far that training for one specific task might impede the plasticity that would be needed for another task. In this case, the the training schedule of a patient would have to be adapted to have those training sessions on different days or even different weeks to make sure that the patient has full, full possibilities to learn each task individually. However, since we still do not fully know what the circuits are that we are training and what that are necessary for each task, we cannot fully understand how treatments might interfere with each other. More research is needed to ensure the best possible treatment possibilities for each patient individually. In the end, neurorehabilitation is always a bridge between basic science and clinical practice. We try to apply treatments that are based on current biological knowledge in a clinical setting to maximize the possible outcome for the patient. In the acute phase, the aim is to decrease cell death as much as possible to save as much brain as we can. In the chronic phase, once the extent of neuronal death has manifested, the goal of neurorehabilitation is to increase plasticity to enable learning of skills, which will ultimately lead to an increased quality of life for the patients. However, in clinical settings, this has only translated, uh, translated to a limited improvement of function so far. One current idea in research, which will hopefully translate into clinical care as soon as it's available, is to combine neurorehabilitative neuro training with additional treatment options, such as growth enhancers, as I've said before. Here, we could stimulate the plasticity of the nervous system using pharmaceuticals and create more axons and synapses, um, and then use neurorehabilitative neuro training afterwards to strengthen the new, newly created circuits that are of use to us. This might increase the possible outcome for the patient further than your neuro rehabilitation alone. What I would like to end on today is that neuro, neuro rehabilitation, I am getting worse and worse in saying this word, so I'm lucky, I'm glad that we're coming to an end soon. So what I would like to end on today is that neuro rehabilitation is, as I said before, evidence-based medicine. 
While it is always designed according to clinical judgment and the patient's situation, it also considers current scientific evidence. A lot of research, therefore, are exploring additional treatment options that can be combined with neurorehabilitation to increase the maximum possible outcome for the patient, as you can see here. Some of the treatment options under investigation are still in a preclinical development phase, meaning that they're still being tested and researched using animal models, but a lot of them actually were successful in preclinical assessment and are now being investigated in in human clinical studies. And they might be ready for a broad clinical application very soon. With those new upcoming treatment opportunities, we will hopefully be able We'll, we will hopefully be able to use all strategies available to fully push the potential of neurorehabilitation um, and to enable patients of neurological conditions to maximize their potential for functional recovery and finally to increase their quality of life to the best of our knowledge. With that being said, if you are interested to learn more about this topic, I would like to recommend the following TED Talks that have inspired me personally massively. Uh, I hope we will be able to link these talks in the description section of this YouTube video, so you should be able to follow the links. Otherwise, just Google for the headlines that are given above the, the picture. The first talk that I want to recommend is from a scientist who actually has experienced a stroke on her own and describes how it felt to her and how it influenced her life afterwards. The second talk is from a researcher who talks about how lesions can affect motor learning and how to aid patients in recovering from brain injury using technologies such as virtual reality. And the last one is a talk by a former athlete who shares her powerful story about the human potential for recovery. With that, I am at the end of my talk. Thank you all for listening in. I am sad that I couldn't do this more interactively with you guys, but I hope I was able to get your neuroplasticity up and learn a few things from this. If you do have follow-up questions, as I said, I will be available at the beginning of the last session, which will be given on April 2nd. Until then, please stay safe and enjoy your social isolation. Bye.